Hello everyone, welcome to what will be pre-lecture number 35. We're going to talk about nomenclature and do some more solution stoichiometry practice in class. As we get into that, uh, I want to revisit some material we talked about early in their earlier in the semester, and particularly uh, ionic compounds are where we have bonds, uh, which I put in quotes because we uh, these bonds are essentially held in place by uh, fully positive and fully negative charges of ions. And so that is what makes an ionic compound ionic, is we have ions that have this positive or negative charge. Uh, we also then have a metal and a nonmetal, right? The exception to that is when we have ammonium and H4 plus as a cation that can still form ionic compounds despite it not being a metal. Okay. So if we think about what we actually call these things, uh, the positively charged part are called cations, just as a remember that, so not cautions here, that is cations. And they're named for the element uh, from which they are formed. And if that element is a transition metal in the middle of our periodic table, we need to specify what the oxidation state is. So um, here are some examples of kind of more of our main group elements. Uh, one exception here is zinc 2 plus is technically where in our transition metal section, but zinc will only ever have a charge of 2 plus or 0. Uh, it doesn't ever have anything else. Then uh, our transition metals shown here, uh, for example, if we differentiate between iron 2 plus and iron 3 plus, we can show that with our chemical symbol and the iron. We can also show that uh, with our Roman numerals being present after the word iron or tin or copper or whatever metal we are looking at, okay? Uh, two polyatomic cations that you're responsible for knowing that we've discussed in class. Uh, if we add an extra proton to water, it becomes H3O+. Plus. This is something called hydronium. You're going to be dealing a lot with this uh, in second semester general chemistry. And then the other one that I already mentioned on this slide is ammonium and H4+. Plus. Okay. Uh, we also, of course, have negatively charged things, uh, and we call those anions, uh, and those are formed uh, when we have more electrons than protons in something, and basically the nomenclature, how we would call compounds in which uh, we have anions, is we chop off the end, usually this is like an ane, um, and replace it with an ide. And so an example is chlorine, the element, when it becomes Cl minus, becomes chloride, okay? So uh, there are just a few examples from the periodic table. We've talked about all of these at different points in the class, but uh, I just wanna go over explicitly the nomenclature now at this point, okay? So those are some examples. And of course, our other main anions are from our polyatomic uh, chart that hopefully you have memorized because those uh, are not going away anytime soon. And so just a reminder that uh, these exist and you should know what they are, okay? So uh, those are our anions. And then uh, that is how we name ionic compounds then we have different rules for covalent compounds. And so just a reminder, covalent compounds, we share electrons between two elements. Uh, these elements will always be two non-metals or semi-metals, right? And because they are oftentimes more complex, uh, we need to add prefixes to tell us how many of each element we have. And so uh, pretty much you put however many elements you have, you add the appropriate prefix for it. Uh, the one exception is typically when we only have one element uh, or one kind of element, I should say, we would say mono. Uh, we don't typically use that, um, and the only big example is carbon monoxide. Okay, so uh, you don't really need to specify mono. If you just have one of something, you just say that element, and it's implied that you only have one of them. Okay. So uh, one other thing I want to cover in this pre-lecture video are what are called oxidation numbers or oxidation states. And so these are describing the charge state on each element uh, within a compound. And it's a way for us to basically keep track of the electrons that we have. 
We have, uh, as chemists, come up with a set of rules to determine an oxidation number uh, for elements in each compound. And so you just need to follow these rules and you'll end up with the right oxidation state. So those rules are that any free element uh, or any element just bound to itself has an oxidation state of zero. Um, that is just a rule, anything that's pure element, oxidation state is zero. Uh, unless we just have a monoatomic ion, meaning we have one atom and it has a charge, the oxidation state on that will be equal to the charge. And so for an example, if we think about chloride, Cl minus, the oxidation state of chloride there would be one minus, right? Uh, if you have polyatomic ions then, uh, or polyatomic particles, with a neutral charge, then the sum of all the oxidation states for all of the atoms has to add up to zero. And in polyatomic ions, the sum of, oh, oh, <laughs> sum of all the oxidation states has to add up to the charge on the polyatomic ion. And we'll do some examples of that in class in case that is not clear at the moment. Next rule is that group one and two metals, so that means metals in uh, the first column and second column of the periodic table have an oxidation state according to their place. So uh, anything in the first column will have a plus one charge. Anything in the second column will have a plus two charge. Something that I haven't mentioned yet uh, that sh I should mention here at this point is that all of these rules have to be followed in order. Okay, so uh, whatever the top, the highest rule is, that will be the most important rule, okay? Just as a, a fair warning there. Our next rule uh, is that some elements almost always have the same charge. And so we have, uh, again, priorities for these. Uh, fluorine will always have a minus one charge. The exception, of course, being if it were F2, it would just be the element, the oxidation state of fluorine in F2 is zero. But in all other cases, fluorine will have a charge of minus one. Another example, hydrogen should always be plus one. Again, exceptions would be H2, uh, or one other two, exception we'll talk about in a second. Uh, C, we have oxygen having a charge of two minus, unless it is a peroxide, and peroxide's formula is O2, two minus, in which case each oxidation, each oxygen's Oxidation state will be minus one, apologies. Um, and then finally, group 17, these are our halogens, should have a charge of minus one. Group 16 should have a charge of minus two, and group 15 will have a charge of minus three. Okay, and those are rules that we've already had in place uh, on the periodic table. Finally, last rule, all other element oxidation states are calculated based on what is left. And so, this may seem a little bit uh, strange at the time to just receive these rules, but I promise you we will spend a good amount of class time applying them and that will hopefully make them a bit clearer. Also, if it's helpful, uh, our textbook has a nice figure on basically all the possible oxidation states each element can have. So if that is helpful for you to look at, uh, then please go ahead and take a look. Otherwise, that's it for the pre-lecture video. I uh, hope that was helpful and I will see you in class.